Good morning. This is the 1030 session. Um, can genomics save the ocean? We're going to broaden that a little bit. It's going to be uh, climate change, our oceans, and our future. We'll talk about genomics, but uh, we're going to be talking about some other things as well. I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. Roger Payne is the founder and the president of Ocean Alliance. His life's work is whale research. His life's work is protecting and helping whales. Uh, James Baylog, uh, 2013's Chasing Ice, and of course, last night's The Human Element, 2018. He's also the founder and director of Earth Vision Institute and Extreme Ice Survey. And Bill Neal, he's a local Park City resident. Uh, he is the producer and the director for a film which is in final production. It'll be out real soon. It's called Long Gone Wild. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a movie that, that picks up where Blackfish left off. It's going to deal with the plight of captive orcas uh, in North America as well as the looming crisis in Russia and China. Uh, everybody, please uh, visit our panelists' full bio. Uh, it's a, a very impressive bio. And when you uh, take a look at the bio and you look at Roger's bio, he's in an impeccably tailored uh, tuxedo with about 150 penguins uh, behind him. So it was a pretty good picture. Well, that, I figure, you know, when in Rome, that was my thought. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Roger, why don't we start with you? Can you give us the current report card of our oceans and its inhabitants? Uh, yes, it, it, this prepared to be totally depressed if you aren't already. I think the overall aspect of this, which is so important, is the fact that, you know, even if you live in the middle of Kansas or the middle of Siberia, you're nowhere near the ocean you are in fact completely, your life is completely controlled in some ways that are very subtle, but by the ocean. Uh, if you look at the amount of oxygen which you breathe, it turns out between half and two thirds of every breath you take came from plant life, not on land, but plant life in the ocean. That means if we kill the ocean, and we're doing quite a good job right now, we will end up eventually losing some percentage of the oxygen that we breathe in every breath. I decided, okay, well, whatever. How bad could it be to lose this much oxygen? Uh, and I, thought, I just thought, oh, I know a good way to measure it. You could see how far up a mountain you would have to go before you had, were not getting enough partial pressure of oxygen to, to uh, before it was uncomfortable and equaled half to two thirds. And the answer is, don't worry at all, there's no problem. It's only about 150 meters higher than Mount Everest, which means it's in the death zone, which also means that if we do kill the oceans effectively and get rid of the plant life at the surface of the oceans, probably won't get it on the bottom, but at the surface, we will not make it. We have no future at all if we do that. That, to me, makes the problem of ocean health probably the single most important problem humanity faces right now. We talk about global warming, and yes, that's a big problem. I don't think it's the worst. I think the worst one, as measured by how fast it gets us, is ocean acidification, because ocean acidification get, builds up to a point where it does its major damage in a few decades, whereas ocean warming, or global warming, excuse me, builds up over, you need to get more nearly a century before the rise has gone beyond two degrees and on up to a point where everything is, is, there's no hope for anything. So how important is the problems of the, problem of the ocean? I think it's the biggest problem faced by humanity. I think it is the biggest problem ever faced by humanity. And uh, I once made a full list of all the problems that the ocean faces. And I won't read it to you because it read it to you because it takes about a minute and a half to read at very high speed just the titles of all of these problems, including things that almost nobody thinks about, like sea level canals, which mix in unpredictable ways, fauna from both sides, from two oceans, the one that's going to go across, for example, uh, in uh, in Central America. I want to talk about the one that I've spent most of my life on. I've spent. Uh, a long time working uh, uh, for the conservation of whales, but there's a guy here named Paul Gouin who is going to be speaking tomorrow. 
and I recommend you all hear him. He's what's known as the phantom in the world of whale saving. He has done more to save whales than all but two other people. The three of them are the top people who've ever worked in it. Don't miss that talk. But I think that the problem that, of, uh, of ocean pollution is the one that gets me most interested because I got my Institute Ocean Alliance to make a voyage around the world. It took us five and a half years. We were getting samples of skin and blubber from sperm whales, usually without any reaction at all from the whale, tiny samples. But these we were able to measure for the background collections of pollutants that they contain. And we discovered, we, we, we were able to analyze these sam samples which came from, sorry, just under 1,000 sperm whales over a five-year period in all oceans, all collected by the same means so you could look at what is the background level of contaminants in the ocean. We're able to support the, uh, to, to find the funding to analyze the samples for their metals. It, you don't want to know what the response is there. Of course, there's mercury. Of course, there's lead. We all expected that. But there's also chromium. And in the most remote area in which we ever sampled sperm whales in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and near the Gilbert Islands, we came back with concentrations of sperm whales, which equaled the concentrations of found in workers in chromium plants, of all things, um, which were, had been there for 20 years and died of lung cancer, which is what happens if you end up uh, inhaling a lot of that stuff. So these whales somehow have picked that up. Nobody has any idea how. We have some theories. They're pretty nearly worthless. And uh, it, so, but that was that surprise result. We haven't been able to raise the funds to analyze the samples for the organohalogens, so-called. These are compounds which contain an organic molecule with a halogen of bromine or a chromium is the usual ones that you, that you find on them. And these, can, these are, uh, are chemicals which are at, uh, they do extraordinary mischief. They have most of them never existed before. Some have, but most haven't. There are thousands of different varieties of them. They've been released into the environment. Nothing is known about anything except this measurement of their concentrations are going around the world. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have the funds to do it. It's about 1,500 bucks a pop to do it. And, uh, but we have all the materials that are, make it possible to do it. Those sorts of results now are pointing to what, what we know so far is a series of threats so massive that I think everything that anyone does in their life should include a huge, in fact, the biggest portion of your life that you can afford to give to it, working on the condition of the environment. Because otherwise, our grandchildren have no future. I have eight of them. And they otherwise have no future at all. Maybe I should stop there and let somebody else talk a while. Well, I. I thank you for that you report up. card. Yeah. I mean, we need to establish a baseline before we start talking about some other things. Jim, do you have anything to add to that uh, report card? Yeah, I think from, from my perspective, is this one? Uh, yeah. Can't tell. Yeah, OK, there we go. What we, what we need to assimilate into our thinking is that we're in the midst of a massive adjustment in the basic physical parameters of the ocean and the topography where land and ocean come together. Uh, as Roger said, we've got a massive change in the chemistry of the oceans uh, uh, underway. And by the way, approximately 50% of the carbon dioxide that human industry has emitted the past 200 years has been absorbed by the ocean. That's why the acidification is happening. But the ocean has, been, has given us a gift. It has saved us from already being at something like 550 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. We're only in the low 400s right now, which is bad enough, but it would have been a lot worse without the ocean acting as a carbon sink. Um, we have changes in the heat balance of the ocean. One thing that's not uh, evident to most people is that as, as uh, seawater warms, it expands. So a, a nearly half of the sea level rise that's going on around the world is from the expansion of the ocean as it's warming up. So we have chemistry, heat, the volume of the ocean changing, and the boundary conditions changing. Um, 
on average around the world, sea level is going up about a 16th of an inch per year. But what also is little known is that that is, uh, that sea level rise is not evenly distributed. It actually, the water tends to pile up in certain areas because of the way wind, currents, weather, and land masses and their gravity fields affect the movement of water. One of the highest areas for sea level rise is the east coast of the United States uh, and the east coast of Southeast Asia. Uh, and not incidentally, the Southeast US and Southeast Asia are ground zero for serious tropical cyclones. Uh, because of the way the currents move, because of the way the air masses move, and because of the warm water. And that's why the southeast U.S. obviously keeps getting hammered by huge storms like Hurricane Michael that just clobbered Florida yesterday. Um, so we've got about a sixteenth of an inch per year on average, but some places like uh, Lower Chesapeake Bay, Norfolk, Virginia, they've had a foot and a half of sea level rise in the past hundred years. And that's just at the current rates of ice loss. Be, uh, let me emphasize that, actually. Um, where does the sea level rise water come from? It comes from melting glaciers. In the mountain glaciers, Greenland ice sheet, Antarctica. And those places, as we know, are warming up and changing. The water goes in the ocean, the seas come up. We're projecting easily one to two feet of sea level rise in the next uh, 80 years or so as a consequence of Antarctica changing and Greenland changing and the mountain glaciers changing. But there are big changes happening in West Antarctica right now that seem to suggest that that sea level rise will be much more than two feet or so. Uh, West Antarctica could deal a serious knockout punch of three, four, five, six, seven feet of sea level rise in the next 80 years. Or the so. ice sheet is melting much more rapidly than we think in, in West Correct. Antarctica. Yes. And one last point. Um, and this took me uh, a long time to figure out, and it really only became clear when we were working on that scene in the film uh, with Tangier Island in, in Norfolk. What we have to think about here is not just this tiny little vertical change in the sea level. It's a horizontal change as well, a lateral change. We're in the midst of this gigantic boundary adjustment between where the sea stops and where inhabited land begins. That's changing. And it's hard, kind of hard for all of us to get our heads around that. But as the seas come up a little bit and the storms drive more and more water inland through their increased fury and power as the, as the air and the water warms, we're having a change in the actual physical edge, the mapping of these boundaries between, between uh, uh, land and water. And that has gigantic consequences for, the, uh, for people who live along the coast. Well, the report card is serious. Uh, it, uh, it's depressing. Um, what, but is there any hope out there? What big sweeping ideas are out there that give you hope? You're asking me. So. The entire panel. Well, I, you know, I think there are a number of organizations uh, that are addressing this. Um, but I would just like to add to what uh, Roger and, and James said, which is, and, and, and James brought it down to Chesapeake Bay. And my, my focus has been on captive orcas, uh, primarily for this documentary, which end up in concrete tanks. But in researching this topic, um, naturally you start to look at orcas in the wild. And if you zero in on one particular area, the global issue, as Roger so articulately said, is very critical. If you zero in on one particular area, like the Salish Sea, where the southern resident orcas have gone from 98 to 76 in just the last few years. And the reason is lack of food. Chinook salmon are their primary uh, source of nutrients. Noise pollution and the pollution of the water itself. So it's not only affecting the humans, on the planet, this crisis. It's also affecting iconic 
uh, animals like the orca. So, and, and, and fortunately, on the upside, people like Mark Anderson, who we all know, uh, is, has been working on this issue for uh, the last decade or more to address this. Uh, so there, there is hope, but it is something that we all need to be aware of and focus on. It's closer to 40 years. That's how I met Mark. Was he was, I'm sorry? It's closer to 40 years for Mark. He was one of the founders of the Whale Museum up there, right. which is the best one around. And uh, that, that's, he's done it a long time. Yes, he has. <laughs> yeah. Where is the Salish Sea? That's uh, Puget Sound, Washington area. Right. And Roger that's where, and uh, for example, uh, Lolita, who is considered the world's loneliest orca, she was captured uh, back in 1970. Uh, in, uh, in Puget Sound, and she's been in a tiny tank in, at the Miami Seaquarium ever since then. Okay. Jim and Roger, any big sweeping ideas that have your attention? Well, the, thing give that, you hope? the only thing that ever gives me any hope at this point is that I think once humanity decides to change its mind, it does so at blindingly fast speed. And the example that all of us in this room probably lived through uh, was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, the Soviet Union imploding. And when you looked at what the United States government had to say about that at the time, what it really came down to was, gee whiz, wow, look at that. The wall is coming down. Nobody knew what to say, basically, as far as I could see. And the same thing is true of slavery. If you had been in the 19th century, you know, on a, a very respected pillar of your community on the right boards and doing all sorts of things, and somebody who was an abolitionist had come along and suggested the freeing of slaves, you might have said to them, I mean, are you out of your mind? Are you telling me that for some completely strange just feeling that you have that we should destroy the entire economic base of this country? I mean, give me a break, get real. And yet, thank God, humanity did it and it changed. And when it does change, it sweeps so fast that nobody can keep up with it. So what I'm hoping, hoping excuse me, is that once people finally see something which really affects them, that, or they see that it affects them is what I should say, because all these things do, but it, those that they see and it's strong enough and vivid enough that they will suddenly rise up. And I think when they do, all of us will be shocked, we'll all be surprised that anything ever moved that fast. Before that happens, I'm in total despair most of the time and feeling as to <laughs> there are lots of wonderful things that are going on, wonderful groups, including my own, which do great stuff in some local area with some measurable effect. But I'm talking about a problem that is just orders and orders of magnitude greater. And unless we do something about that, I see it's all over. I want to add one more point, and that is I would beg the press to do a better job of paying attention to the environment. Nothing else that you talk about, I don't care whether it's the presidency right. or whatever it is, has nearly the importance of an environmental issue. And the importance of environmental issues comes from the fact that they're going to be with us forever. I mean, everything that Trump and co. have undone of all the work that all of us put together for the environment in, in the past, that can all be returned slowly. But what can't be returned is the loss of the time that occurred during the, the, the period of this crazy administration that we have at the moment. And that is a real disaster. And for the press not to be spending at least a third of their time talking about it seems to me to be a terrible mistake. Nothing that I ever see in the papers would pass the 500-year test when 500 years from now people will, will, go, will give a damn who won whatever election it was or whoever the president was 500 years ago. And th nobody will even care if there's something left called the United States or what was it? Oh, yeah, America. I mean, that won't matter. What they'll only care about, and you can predict it with certainty, is the fact that we didn't do enough to make the change, and we could have, but we didn't. We lacked the will. And the will often comes from the press, and I just hope they do more. There aren't many examples. There aren't many examples, but there are some of organizations being jolted out of their complacency 
to act. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are fishing communities that have, that have done that, but we need more examples of that, and I agree with you. Uh, Jim, anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, carrying on the slavery analogy, I think it's worth noting that the Europeans were already outlawing slavery in the late 1700s and into the early 1800s. We were still deeply entrenched in that system, and it wasn't until we had the Civil War in the 1860s that slavery ended. That's we, right. We know what that bloodshed was about. We don't want to go there again. Right. Uh, but the point is that there are other actors on the international stage that are not us who are in many cases more visionary and smarter mm -hmm. about making these things change and move forward. And the European Union, uh, until this Brexit fiasco had, has kind of turned the thing upside down, the European Union was leading the way on dealing with these big systemic environmental changes. Yeah. Right. Look, could I just add to the, the slavery point, <clears throat> what finally changed it was a single case in England and I can't remember the date, 18, early something. And it was a case which declared finally that a slave, I mean, his name is famous and I can't, I can't remember names, it, that that slave was actually a person and not a thing. And that personhood is what just swept like a wildfire, the ones that we saw in Jim's wonderful movie yesterday, throughout all of humanity. And I think that is a step that is it's super important, which is going on. There's a guy named Steve Wise, who's leading it, an excellent lawyer, who is working on trying to achieve personhood for, at the moment he's working on chimps, but he's also doing stuff on wh whales, excuse me, and elephants and other species. But he's focused mostly on, on chimps. He's getting close to winning, very close. And personhood, is misunderstood by many judges, as he points out. It does not equal a human being. That's not what it is, legally speaking. What personhood is, is something which has, uh, uh, there are a series of things, I can't now remember them at the top of my head, but there are rivers which are person, persons. There's one in, in uh, New Zealand. There are, of course, as we all know, corporations have personhood, they're persons. There are, you know, there's a mosque somewhere that is a person, has personhood, excuse me, not is a person, has personhood. And if he can succeed in giving personhood to chimpanzees, I think it will be the biggest sweep that could happen. I would just urge anybody to support him. And that builds directly into what you'll be hearing uh, Paul Gouin talk about tomorrow. If I just might add to that, uh, Roger, the, um, we interviewed Steve, uh, oh, great. and uh, uh, it's the Non-Human Rights Project, and his documentary, Unlocking the Cage, which yeah, Fire wonderful. Films got behind very much, is a wonderful documentary. And it's all about, it's not about humans, it's about rights. And so what Steve is fighting for right now is a, is a chimp uh, named Tommy, who has been a client for five years, uh, he's also doing the same for elephants, and orcas are next on his list. The reason he hasn't fought for orcas so far is because there was no place for them to go, and now there will be with the Whale Sanctuary Project. Right. So, yeah, Steve okay. is yeah, how very foolish, much on the front lines. How embarrassing that I forgot that it's, of course, through this organization fire that I met Steve. <laughs> That's the first yeah, time right, I did too. Apologies. I'd like to touch on this this depression issue, the despair issue, because it's pervasive. Let's look at it eyes wide open. We're, we're, if, if you have any concerns about the environment, uh, the world that we're living in the past uh, year and a half is enough to make you want to slash your wrists. And uh, I mention it because there's a light at the end of that tunnel per something I heard a few weeks ago. So, you know, a lot of psychologists say that depression is anger turned inwards which right. it often is. Sometimes it's something else, but it's often anger turned inwards. And I've certainly seen that in my own self in reaction to what's going on in Washington. You know, you just kind of read the paper in the morning and you go, God damn it, I can't do anything about it. And it's like a knife in your heart every single day. And uh, I realized a few months ago that action can be anger turned outwards. So that's, so action is the alternative to the anger making you depressed. So 
well, what does this have to do with all of this? And where's the reason for hope? Two weeks ago, <clears throat> we screened the film at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden. And you know, it's this huge complex. I had never been in there before, but lots and lots of real estate and lots and lots of smart engineers um, and scientists working on the problem of uh, climate change and, and renewable energy. And I figured everybody would be down in the dumps. So well, during the Q&A after the film, I said, uh, I'm wondering how you guys are feeling about the world today. How many of you are optimistic versus how many of you are pessimistic? And it was like the optimists outnumbered the pessimists by about 10 to 1. And there were, you know, 75 people or so in the room. And I was stunned. I said, what, are you guys crazy? What are you smoking here? You know, how, how can you be optimistic? What are you, what are you optimistic about? And they said, oh, well, the great thing that's emerged over the past few years is that renewable energy in many marketplaces around the country is on par with fossil fuels. And I said, yeah, I heard that, and I've heard that in little pieces in places here and there. They said, no, no, no. At the broad scale, At the top we, line. we can now compete with even natural gas in many marketplaces. And that's a huge thing, James. So don't be so damn pessimistic and growly about it. So that, that's one thing that I take optimism from. And the other one is more or less what Roger said, that we have these great brains, we have these great technological capabilities, and if we are motivated enough, things can change really quickly, and we know we have alternatives now. So there is some hope at the end of this tunnel, some way out of the black hole that we seem to be in right now. And We're going to take uh, a couple of questions, but first I want to ask Roger a real quick question, just a yes or no answer. So we have, uh, we have a food chain of, micro, of microbial, phytoplankton, all the way up to whales. In that flu uh, food chain, with all the problems that we have, uh, destruction of coastal habitats, pollution, acidification, two degrees seawater, temperature rise, you're saying that acidification is the toughest problem. I'm just saying it's going to kill, I think it's going to kill the most uh, life in the oceans fastest. That's okay. all, you okay. know, if you get killed, and all, it's a, such a ways. silly thing that I'm saying because it means if you get killed, you know, it, it, uh, 10 minutes earlier than the other, well then that was the most serious problem. Right. That, that, that. <laughs> Let's take a question right here, please. The gentleman was first. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I know Oceana and Sylvia Arl have referred to the problem with our oceans as kind of the public toilet problem, where because everybody owns it, there's no accountability. What do you guys think about this idea of privatizing the oceans? Well, I think, you know, whatever makes it work at this point, it doesn't matter how rough the edges would be or who could take advantage of something or whatever. The problem is so serious and needs reaction so fast that my feeling is practically any solution except engineering the atmosphere. That's the one I would leave out. To me, privatizing is, is a double-edged sword. Sometimes yeah. that works, as we know. Sometimes it leads to exploitation. Yeah. Over we have a minute and a half. One more question. Okay, yeah, and I'll try to keep it super short. It's it's sort of a, a provocation as much as a question. Um, we've been speaking about these things for years now. Some people travel internationally to uh, come to agreements. I mentioned uh, to Jim yesterday this uh, pessimistic philosopher Roy Scranton. You can look him up if you want to get really down and dirty on this topic. But uh, just to suggest that the types of changes, the the level of change that we're going to have to go through in, in all our institutions and in our economies and everything to be able to make this happen. It's going to be very uncomfortable. We always talk about these things in such comfortable environments. I love this place. I'm so freaking comfortable. But what's about to happen is about to be, is about, to be about extreme discomfort, both from the change and then from the actual environmental conditions that we're going to be living in. So uh, do, do, do you guys who seem so well attuned to this issue, are you talking to people about the the discomfort it's going to take to make some of these changes happen, or are we always going to be talking in lovely environments like this about something that's going to happen in the future? I don't necessarily buy seconds. the idea that it's <clears throat> inherently uncomfortable. There will be changes in the economic hierarchies as, as these things shift, but I don't think it's necessarily uncomfortable in the way that, uh, that people on the street 
feel it. There's still going to be electrons coming out of light bulbs, et cetera, et cetera. It's just yeah. replacement technologies. Just in one sentence, just think of it as how wonderful it'll be for the comfort that you'll see in a change which is going to save your life. We are out of time. Thank I you. want to thank uh, our great panel here, Roger, Jim, and Bill. Thanks.